Thank you. I want to thank uh, Susan um, for her leadership with the council. This is an extraordinary um, bringing together of the, the leaders th th throughout uh, Latin America and the United States who are interested in better relations and better business ties um, between our hemispheres. And it's very, very exciting to be with you. I also want to thank Eric, uh, who runs your Washington office and does a terrific job in Washington. And both of you have been ter wonderful in helping um, on 100,000 Strong, which we will get into in a few minutes. And I love being here with Roberta Jacobson, who does a terrific job at the State Department. Um, I'm comp I love the fact that you've invited Maryland to be your representative state. Um, so I hope all of you visit Maryland, spend time in Maryland, and love Maryland. Yes? This audience has to wake up. <laughs> um, and we're very lucky, uh, I have to tell you, to have um, Governor O'Malley um, come and speak with us today. Uh, he has been called by the Washington Monthly arguably the best manager in government. Um, he has uh, had an extraordinary uh, legislative session, which the Baltimore Sun has called without parallel in recent Amer uh, Maryland history. Under uh, Governor O'Malley's leadership, Maryland has been now for five years number one in K through 12 education, uh, has been called by College Board the best state to reduce tuition uh, um, or to keep a hold on tuition at higher education institutions, and by the Chamber of Commerce for the second year in a row, been called Maryland is the number one state for innovation and entrepreneurship. So you can see how well uh, Governor O'Malley has led the state. He's also focused on, and I work with him a lot, on reducing crime, and now Maryland is at its lowest crime uh, in three decades. He's helped to clean up the Chesapeake Bay, and for this audience, he has been a real leader, in particular uh, in the DREAM Act, making Maryland the first state in the country to pass a DREAM Act. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and our governor, um, Governor Martin O'Malley. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Thanks. Thanks very much. Lieutenant Governor, thank you. And thank you for everything that you've done for, for our state. I think each of us in our short time in, in office do our very best to move the ball further down the field. And, and you did so much as our Lieutenant Governor laying the groundwork for so many things in education and also public safety. And thank you for your continued leadership. And that the next horizon, which is that horizon over the Southern Hemisphere, uh, and I do believe that there's tremendous opportunities to create jobs and to expand opportunity as Marilyn realizes her role in, um, in strengthening the ties that unite us in this American hemisphere. Great. Well, let's talk about, um, you know, one of the, somebody asked me earlier at breakfast, why are we having a governor at the, the council? And I think it was Maurice Sonnenberg sitting in the front row. And, um, and I said, because right now, what is happening in this country is at the state level. And so, um, and uh, as you can see, Governor O'Malley's done an extraordinary job. So would you talk about what, what, is, what is going on with you in Latin America? What are the ties and how is the business um, being helped by our ties with Latin America? Well, one of the most obvious connections in terms of economic ties between our state and uh, and our, our neighbors in Central and South America is the Port of Baltimore. Um, almost about 10% of the imports and nearly 10% of the exports through the Port of Baltimore are, are, uh, are, is trade that happens with South and Central America. And we believe that we can do even more in the years ahead, which is why we concluded the largest public private partnership in 2009 to expand the size of our port to accommodate the larger ships that pass through the Panama Canal. And in fact, immediately after leaving all of you today, I'll be going up to Baltimore to christen one more crane that allows us to expand that, uh, that trade. So we believe that our future, uh, indeed as our past has been, that our future is very closely connected to opportunities and rising standards of living in Central and South America. And we want to strengthen those trading partnerships. At the same time, we also realize that you know, the, the drivers of job creation in our state uh, are those uh, areas that um, 
where we need to accelerate innovation in terms of the security of our people, the skills of our people, and the sustainability of our way of life, not to mention the health of our people. And we believe that the partnership throughout the Americas can be key to uh, creating those sorts of jobs in our state and also learning, for, let's be honest, from, uh, from countries in South America, in particular Brazil, that is so far ahead of us on the sustainability curve in terms of energy and the localizing of sustainable economies. Thank you. Um, you know, I, as in the introduction, I said that Maryland was the first state uh, to pass the DREAM Act, and you were a real leader in that. And you not only got it passed in the legislature, but when it went to referendum, you fought to make sure that it was sustained. Can you describe why you thought that was important and how you won? Hey, because I serve, uh, serve good people. <laughs> And uh, one of the things um, that, you, that you and I share in addition to our love of Maryland is an understanding of our own immigrant histories and sure. a time not too long ago when signs and shops and, and windows uh, read no Irish need apply. Uh, I believe that immigration and the arrival of new Americans is an energy that recharges our creative battery as a people. Uh, that has been particularly true of Baltimore since her very founding and also of the state of Maryland. Stated another way, we believe that policies of inclusion, policies that recognize that diversity is our strength, policies that cherish the, uh, the dignity and differences of every individual, are policies that help to build up an innovation economy that make one state an attractive place for the creative class and, and high uh, attaining and, and, well, and highly motivated people. Stated a different way, policies of exclusion, policies of discrimination are really bad for building up an innovation economy. Uh, this first quarter of the year, Maryland achieved the fourth fastest rate of job growth of any state in the union. And uh, a recent, you mentioned uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, second year in a row, named our state number one for innovation and entrepreneurship, and also uh, made remarks about how many PhDs we have per capita. Uh, what was not reported was that about 25% of all of our scientists are foreign born. 20% of our mathematician PhDs in our state that do such critical work around NSA and everything related to this new domain of security, of cybersecurity, 20% of them are foreign born. So uh, uh, we passed the DREAM Act because we believe very firmly that in the larger and longer arc of our history, that inclusion is good for creating jobs and for creating opportunity. Well, I think obviously we agree on that. Um, could you talk a little bit more about higher education? You know, you heard um, I'm working to get 100,000 strong really going in the Latin America, bringing 100,000 students from Latin America to the United States and making sure that 100,000 students from the United States can go to Latin America. Right now, many students think that they can go to Europe because they, it's easy, their parents did it, or they can go to um, China because they think that's the source of, of jobs and innovation in the future, whereas, in fact, Latin America is the place where so much is going on. You mentioned Brazil, but there's lots going on in Peru and Colombia and in Mexico as well as other countries. And could you talk about how important uh, those kind of partnerships are and the belief that learning from others and being in different countries really is a great way to um, become innovative and entrepreneur yourself and to understand other cultures. Sure, I, I, and, and thank you for everything that you're doing on this and everything you did actually in, when you were Lieutenant Governor as well. I mean, are, I have a great deal of hope and the next generation because our kids understand themselves and are very comfortable with their citizenship of the United States and their understanding that they're also children of, of a larger world. And I think we need to embrace that. And a couple of great examples in our state uh, are uh, Goucher and Loyola. I think in a ranking of, of states that uh, excel at the uh, study abroad, I think Goucher and Loyola were both among the top 15. I think Goucher might have even been number one, I think. Well, Goucher, as you know, requires all the students to have a study abroad experience. Which is, ter which is terrific. I, I only wish after, I only wish I had had a year of immersion, yeah. you know, when I was in, uh, when, when I was in college. Uh, so I think these programs are, are very critically important for a couple of reasons. Uh, not, and, you know, not only the, the value of uh, better and deeper relationships and understandings for their human 
you know, immeasurable human value, but also because of the economic value. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability of our, our sons and daughters to be able to do business and to be able to, to uh, travel comfortably to countries in South and Central America is really the pathway. I mean, so much of, so much of business is really about relationships. When you look at some of the trade deals and ask yourself, why is this one bigger than this one? Why do, why do you know, a lot of it when you peel back the onion comes down to somebody knew somebody else, saw the opportunity and they came together. So I believe that these uh, international exchange, the studies abroad are a really critical piece of our ability to be a competitive and engaged uh, state and nation moving forward. Thank you. Um, and you talked very eloquently about the DREAM Act and immigration, and we heard from Janet Napolitano as to what's going on with the immigration bill in Congress. Uh, could you describe what you think should happen and how you see it going forward? We have a, uh, I mean, we really need this to pass, and I'd love to hear your views about what's going on. Sure, I'm, I'm very, very much in favor of comprehensive immigration reform, and in fact, Perhaps, um, perhaps the passage of comprehensive immigration reform might even be a, the first sign that our polarized fever is breaking mm -hmm. in the House of Representatives. Uh, there was a uh, terrific and compelling study that was uh, talked about by uh, Farid Zakara on CNN mm -hmm. over the weekend about the, uh, the, the degree to which immigration reform is connected to some of the bigger and seemingly intractable challenges that we face in our nation with regard to uh, uh, sustaining and strengthening social security, with regard to improving our GDP, and also with regard to elevating uh, uh, middle class wages in our country. The American people haven't seen a raise for 13 years. And immigration uh, could very well, well hold the key to many of those things. If you look simply at the numbers of people, numbers of family, who are already working hard every day, who are already working in businesses, who are already uh, out there providing for their families, the ability to bring them into the light of an open society where they're paying their taxes uh, 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 across the board could mean an additional $150 billion in, uh, uh, to uh, uh, the United States in, in terms of revenues, and I think I saw a number of roughly 60 billion into state revenues. Uh, also, the ability of, uh, of immigration reform to recognize the fact that there are a lot of young people in our country who through no fault of their own uh, are not yet fully citizens, but consider themselves in every way and contribute to our country and love our country, uh, those DREAM Act uh, kids, so uh, bringing them into uh, uh, the openness of our society in terms of innovation, being able to borrow money, being able to go to school, being able to create a small business, all of those things are are important. And so I'm, I am hopeful, optimistic, and doing going to do everything in my power. And I might add, with like-minded governors, Democrats and Republicans, who believe that we should pass immigration reform, there is such a compelling business case. Set aside compassion, set aside justice, set aside fairness if you must. And if you go only on the business case for immigration reform, the United States of America is losing money and losing jobs every day by not having fixed our archaic uh, uh, immigration policies. And uh, this is low-hanging fruit, if you will. Uh, we, it's not what other countries are doing to us. It's what we're not doing for ourselves in recognizing the tremendous power and the uh, economic imperative of immigration reform. Well, that was very eloquent. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Um, I don't know if there are any questions from the, from the audience. Um, Maurice? Maurice, who, by the way, spent his junior year abroad in Mexico, so is our example of what happens if you get to go to Mexico for your junior yeah, year. Yeah, I'm the perfect example, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to bring you back to immigration, and it's something to do with an area called STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. There was a bill in Congress, because here's what happens. You take a company like Microsoft. Microsoft is in Washington, State, Seattle, slash Redmond. Where do they have their big research and development center? In Vancouver, 70 miles north. 
We have 50% of our graduates at MIT, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Not one of them can get a visa when they graduate. The DREAM Act is good, but what we need is we're short computer scientists, engineers in math, while the Chinese and the other countries are turning these people out. I wonder if you could concentrate and look about this Immigration Act because it is woefully weak in retaining and bringing in Canada. If you need a PhD in something, you get a visa right away if you're foreign born. Would you discuss that a little more? Because I think that's where the competitive edge in this country is beginning to weaken. Sure. Uh, at the, um, if one were to talk to business people throughout that Silicon Valley and ask them what their number one federal priority is, it's not taxes, it's not tax reform, uh, it is immigration reform. Uh, so uh, I don't think any of us for a second believes that the DREAM Act, whether it's done nationally or whether it's done at the state level as Maryland has done it, is a substitute for comprehensive immigration reform. And as I mentioned about our own state and our workforce composition, uh, we convened a, um, a commission on new Americans. In fact, at the time, it was headed by our labor secretary, Tom Perez, who we hope will be all of our labor secretaries, those of us that are uh, United States citizens. And we looked at the workforce, and we looked at the highly skilled nature of the workforce. I mean, sure, yes, there are laborers, and yes, there are people in construction and trades, and, and those jobs are needed too. But in our state, I mean, the number of PhDs, the number of doctors, the number of people who are underemployed uh, in skills areas that we really need well, made for a very, uh, a very compelling case. So absolutely, we do need immigration reform. Wish I had a nickel for every time I heard a Republican governor say, by God, we should, if they graduate one of our schools with a PhD, we should staple a green card to their uh, <laughs> diploma. Yeah, it's a great saying. I've heard it a billion times. So let's step up and, uh, and convince uh, our Republican brothers and sisters in the Congress that this makes good sense for American business and for jobs and opportunity. Um, and, and in fact, I mean, um, I, I don't mean to uh, uh, sound as if I'm, I'm not acknowledging the contributions because I do believe that what's helping us to reach a consensus here is the um, uh, growing chorus of business leaders in our country that are making the case, particularly to uh, the Republican caucus, that this is good business for America. So a DREAM Act is not a substitute. But in passing the DREAM Act, what we hoped we would be able to do, at least as one state, is show that, um, uh, that it is possible to have a rational conversation with one another about the merits of immigration reform. Share a little factoid with you. When we first passed our version of the DREAM Act, which says that if you're um, if you've graduated Maryland high schools and your parents pay tuition, or rather, uh, if you graduated Maryland high schools, your parents pay taxes in Maryland, uh, that you should be able to get in-state tuition in the state of Maryland. When we passed that in our legislature, uh, all of the uh, radio stations and, and typical quarters went nuts and claimed, oh my goodness, this is an outrage. We're giving free tuition to illegal immigrants. And in the initial polling, after we had passed it, uh, the, that um, measure, that DREAM Act, which the, uh, our, our uh, uh, colleagues sent to referendum, we didn't do that. It was a petition drive. But in the initial polling, it was losing Kathleen 55 to 45. By the time the votes were counted a year later, with very little dollars, as you might imagine, on the side of telling people what it actually is. Uh, that passed in our state uh, with about 59% of the vote passed. So that's a huge swing from 55 opposed to 59 support. And um, uh, so it is possible to have a rational conversation like this, but it's not possible to do it from behind a desk. So it's really, really important that business leaders make sure their voice is heard. And uh, your Congress people work for you. I mean, those of us who are here and business people, uh, don't give in to the cynicism that they don't listen. They don't always act rationally together over the last few years, but they will if you call them. They're likely to take your call. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Nelson Cunningham with McClarty Associates. Uh, Governor, the, uh, the president in his second term is facing, uh, has launched a fairly ambitious trade agenda. 
He called for free trade talks with Europe. He is pushing forward with the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks with all of our key, with many of our key Pacific uh, trading partners, including now Mexico and Canada. Uh, what's the perspective from the governor's mansion on these sorts of international trade agreements? I think I, th I think uh, you'll find a uh, I think you'll find a range of opinion within the governors. I think the uh, I would hazard to guess that a majority of us believe that uh, uh, free trade provided it's fair, and that's always the rub, right? Uh, is a is a net benefit for us. Uh, I I believe that at the, I think. You know, at the risk of stating the painfully obvious, we're all part of a global economy. That's not a matter of choice. I mean, that's a reality, and you can't exempt yourself from it. So it would seem to me that to the that to the extent that we can be proactive in concluding agreements with strategic partners, um, geographically, philosophically, uh, that that is a benefit to us. And in our state, I mean, um, and perhaps other states have a different view of this, but in our state, Maryland is a net winner when it comes to trade. I mean, imagine our state and her GDP were it not for the Port of Baltimore and not to mention our, uh, our uh, strategic location on the East Coast and with the rail and the highways and those things. So we're a net winner from trade. Uh, in fact, we've set up uh, recently an, an incubator on the innovation front uh, specifically targeted to uh, foreign companies that want to establish a presence here in the United States. And uh, I've, I've made uh, quite a few more trade missions myself in the second term than I did in the first. And among the regrets I have when I leave office in a couple of years will probably be that I did not do more of that because uh, I think it's irresponsible not to be more engaged. Uh, Fred uh, uh, Hochberg of the, uh, of the Import Export Bank, looking at Maryland's portfolio, was struck by how many small and medium-sized businesses avail themselves in Maryland of, uh, of, of Fred's help. And so we want to promote more of this. The most dynamic business group that we have, I believe, in our state. I should say one of the most, right? You never yeah. want to tell your kids they're your favorite. <laughs> so one of the most dynamic groups in our state in terms of business is the World Trade Center Institute in Baltimore. And it is a uh, eclectic, dynamic, and vibrant ecosystem of Maryland companies across the board uh, that are very engaged globally in the big markets that are there for American companies. And increasingly, uh, growing markets for American services abroad, you know, A&E and the, and the like, uh, so. Yes, thank you. Yes, Governor. I'm very interested in what you've been saying about the development of the Port of Baltimore uh, to take the big ships that will be coming through the Panama Canal extension because, as you know, today there are very few ports in the country that will be able to handle those big ships that will start to come in 2015, particularly the big mast ship, which uh, has just been built and has nowhere to go except the Pacific because it can't, it'll get through the Panama Canal extension, but it can't go to the ports in the United States because it need, the ports in the United States need a higher draft, and they haven't been dredged for that as yet. And I've gotten very much involved in what's going on in Louisiana, which you're probably familiar with, and uh, uh, Louisiana is a perfect example. Port of New Orleans has no room to expand. And there's another port 30 miles from the Port of New Orleans that has the room to expand, but uh, it's just getting started. Now, uh, what, what, what will the draft be, for example, when you get finished in the Port of Baltimore, and what other things are you uh, doing in order to develop the port to take on those big ships? Okay. Ali, I need to I need to do some more study up on the mast and and its draft, and I and I'm not sure off the top of my head what the uh, uh, what the depth of the port of Baltimore what the port of Baltimore is. I want to say I know that we kept dredging 50. a lot, and we've created a number of islands in the Chesapeake Bay because of our dredging. So we're right. usually focused very much on that. How much over 50 feet? Like 50 over 50 feet, or like 10 over 50 feet? <laughs> Orleans mm -hmm. that has 57 feet. That's the one that I'm involved with. 
But so what do they need a minimum 60 or? No, I think 57 feet will mm -hmm. do it. Uh, over, I think it's 55 feet that it, re it will require. Well, we realize that the ports are lifeblood, and we also realize that um, we also realize that um, given um, given our proximity and the slightly longer distance that ships have to go in order to come up the Chesapeake Bay, that our edge needs to be that we need to maintain our competitive edge by. Um, uh, by being on the front end of the new technologies and implementing them sooner. So it was not an accident, but by very, very intentionally that we created the partnership with Ports America uh, to, in order to accommodate the larger ships coming through the Panama Canal. And I will also say that one of the greatest hopes I have for further and better dredging in the Port of Baltimore is the latest chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Barbara A. Mikulski. And the A stands for always on your side and always about jobs and always about keeping the port competitive. So, um, I mean, these things aren't going to happen by themselves, right? So um, we have had the ability as a state, not easy, not the individual decisions, oftentimes unpopular, but we have managed to make investments in a timely fashion to stay on the front edge of uh, emerging uh, technologies and trade and the new ships. And, we can, and we're going to uh, continue to do that. And with regard to ability to expand, uh, we actually do have ability to expand in Baltimore. Uh, not always for the reasons we would like, but in the transformation and, uh, uh, of uh, our industrial economy, uh, sometimes, uh, quite, in fact, quite often around the old port of Baltimore, there are brownfield sites. So we have become very, very adept at putting to marine use, and we're going to continue to do that. Interesting follow-up. Will this present legislation permit... In, you know what? the last part of this. Uh, okay, I think I'll Susan is saying... Um, the governor gave an eloquent Absolutely. speech. But I'll give you my and card. Questions. Okay. I will and call he's you. actually going right now to the Port of Baltimore, as he said, to um, inaugurate a new crane. So it's, it's, it's of great interest to him and to all of us. I want to thank the governor for coming to, uh, to the State Department, to speaking, and to say, showing how wonderful it is to be lucky enough to live in Maryland with Governor O'Malley. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks to the foundation. Thank you.